just, we all have courage, but it's kind of locked away. Yeah. And we're too scared to just sort of turn the key and let it out. And we're scared for so many reasons. We're scared of failing and we're also scared of doing really well. We're so right. The people who many of us look at and think they are there, hitting all their targets, they are uber successful. A lot of the time, they are very unhappy because so often people's idea of living a best life is leading an Instagram life that is to impress everyone else. Yeah. Hi, and welcome back to the Jacuzzi Performance Podcast. I'm Ed Baxter, and today we're joined by TV presenter, author, and founder of This Girl Is On Fire, Andrew McLean. So last 18 months or so has thrown a lot of challenges, obviously, at loads of different people. And I know you mentioned already that you've decided to change kind of your career path. So what, what kind of challenges has it thrown for you? How's this last 18 months or so been? For me, the best way I think to, to put this is that obviously the past 18 months has been challenging for everybody in their own unique way. And I, I heard it put really nicely by a friend of mine who he said that we're all, we're all in a storm, but we're all in different boats. And I think that really sums up how the, the, the changes that I made were sort of unique to me. And can I just apologize now? My neighbor's having building work done, <laughs> so we're sitting in a really lovely, quiet yeah. garden, but you will hear sort of banging and crashing throughout this. Um, I decided to take something that had been my absolute passion, which is uh, I started a business called This Girl Is On Fire. I say a business, it was a side thing where I was doing it for free. Yeah basically helping women feel better about themselves in, yeah. in so many different ways. It was uh, their mental health, physical health, uh, all, all full 360. And then when, just before the start of the pandemic, uh, we had decided to sort of ramp it up a little bit. And then of course the pandemic happened and yeah. nothing worked out <laughs> the way that, that yeah. it was supposed to. But for me, it had always been in the sort of in the back of my mind, I, I want to go all in on mm. helping women. People use the term female empowerment and it, it, it can sometimes have quite negative connotations in that it, it sounds like it's coming from maybe a, a, a Yeah, yeah. Uh, but actually it's empowerment in that we help you, we help you think better thoughts. For the, for empowered in themselves. Empowering in yourself. Yeah. So how I like to describe it is what I do is I have a gym for the mind yeah. you know if you think a few years ago no one had even thought of this whole idea of having a personal trainer for your body it was yeah. what athletes did yeah, yeah. whereas now it's very very normal people have a gym membership and they go and work on their body and people understand that feeling physically strong is a way to help you feeling mentally strong I really want to turn that on its head that having a gym for the mind is something that is we should all be going to it yeah. should be as normal as olympic athletes have coaches um that helps with your mindset that helps th so that you know 80 percent of what you do comes from yeah. here physicality will carry only so far so for me i wanted to take that whole thing and make it available to all my women that i was working with on the side so you ask what changes did that mean um <laughs> A lot. <laughs> it, it, it meant a lot. So basically, I've I'd been working in TV for it was 26 years, um, a quarter of a century of that at, at ITV. Uh, I'd worked on ITV daytime for my whole TV career. I was I was known. I was liked, respected. All of these things. Why would anybody do a really stupid thing like walking <laughs> away from a perfectly good job? And it was the pandemic because yeah. I thought. There were people who made really sensible decisions for 2020. Um, you know, big plans, big, big game-changing ideas. And then the pandemic happened and all of it was just thrown to the wayside. And it made me realize there were people who were way smarter than me that made big decisions and didn't see this coming. I'm constantly waiting for the per perfect time yeah. to make these changes and go all in on what I really believe in and I've always believed in. So I made a really bold decision and I'm going to walk away from TV and just try because that's yeah. all you can do. And the, the pandemic showed you have you have one life. You don't know what the future holds. Don't sit and wait for the perfect time. If you're really passionate about something, obviously do your due diligence and yeah. just quit your job. <laughs> and, and, you know, 
uh, the way I see it is you make a plan for, for achievement and excellence and you also make a plan for failure. So then you know exactly where you're going but you also know what your backup plans would be for when things don't work. And I sat and I wrote them down, lists of pros and cons. What would I be prepared to take if it didn't work? Okay, could I take that? Could I take that? And I decided yes, so I quit my job. So the pandemic yeah. made me quit my job. Yeah. And how how's that been then? Because that's a massive, massive decision. And said as you said there, you know, you did your due diligence, but still, that's a big thing to just do because yeah. essentially you're going in with, you know, you just said there's 25 years of just doing it over and over again. It's it's nothing you know. How's mm. it been? Tough. It's been really yeah. tough. When you when you switch careers at any point, you know, whether it is an athlete where you've trained your your whole life when you're very young and this is all you know and you have your routines in place your mindset is very very channeled not how I like to see it is our brain has like grooves in it where you your habits yeah. are that routine. you know your routine you get up at this time you you train or you do whatever for me it's like I get up and I prepare and I go in and, and do my show um, I just needed to to form different grooves in my brain yeah. and that was really difficult because mm. I left in December uh, 2020 and I would say the first three months of 2021 were really hard because not only is it blooming winter, so it was dark <laughs> and it was grey and miserable and cold and everything else, um, but suddenly my whole routine had changed. So yeah. whereas I, you know, I'd get up in the morning and I know exactly what my, my day would, would hold, suddenly I'm working from home. I'm I'm having to get used to this day in, day out sameness, which I'd never had. The glory of my past job was, although, yeah. yes, I, I knew what I was doing, but every day was totally different. Yeah. You know, I'm meeting different people. It was very, very difficult and very challenging. And how I got through that was I realized that um, I was trying to lead myself yeah. and actually I needed to look to someone else. So I got a coach. Okay. And uh, it was it was an investment in myself. It was, you know, people people have a very strange idea about coaches and and think, well, why do you need one? Just just you know, go on YouTube and look it up or read yeah. a book or whatever. And that's information, but that's very different. To knowing personal. what to do is very diff different to doing it. So for me, it was all about yeah. retraining my brain. Yeah, that's interesting because some of the most successful people I know and, and I work with have got a life coach, have got someone who, who helps them, guides them, just has that. So did you just feel like you needed that person to just say, or even was it a little bit of clarification for yourself if you think, I think I should do this, but I'm not sure I need someone to just go yes or no, or do you feel like having that person was very important? Then? So when I first stopped doing the job that I've been doing for 25 years, it was really hard, I'll be honest, because you know there's this flurry of excitement that you've made this decision, right, I'm going all in, I'm gonna pivot, I'm switching career. And that's really hard to do at any age, whether it's someone like you who is you know, uh, an, an athlete and you've trained your whole life to go in one direction, and then things change and you're, you're either pivoting or you've realized, right, I, I can't necessarily do that at the level I want to anymore, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna pivot. Um, I realized that what I needed to do was stop trying to lead myself because I was really good in one arena and I'd gradually grown with that skill set myself over the years because in TV no one really trains you. They throw yeah. you in at the deep end <laughs> and you either drown or you manage to swim to the side and they go, oh, she's all right or he's all right. <laughs> but with you know other parts of your life, it doesn't work that way. So I thought I need someone to be my accountability buddy but also to champion me when I'm doing things right but also really push me when I'm either doubting myself or holding myself back so I got a coach yeah. and although I'd I'd read a lot of books I'd been on courses and this sort of thing I'd never had someone work specifically just with me and it's a game changer yeah because you're working with someone as you know who grows to understand you it takes a little while but grows to understand where your strengths and your weaknesses are where your self-doubt comes from and the, the little bits because you always do the bits that you find easy first yeah. and then no matter what yeah. it is and then to sort of push you a little bit well, why do you think you feel so uncomfortable with that and push that bit forward and that massively massively helped me through the, the that first i'd say the first quarter of the year was the transition from completely changing what I had been doing, getting used to whole new routines. And I like to see it as 
we have grooves in our brain and I, I'm a very visual person so I picture this as you know when you see sheep walking up hills yeah. and you know they flatten the grass yeah, and yeah. they form <laughs> I think of my brain as like that because I've walked the same path so often I almost have little grooves in my yeah. brain like sheep do so I just needed to form new grooves in my brain so that the my daily patterns my daily habits that I did felt yeah. as weird as trying to brush my teeth with the other hand yeah. then it just became really normal and it, it I would say it took three or four months for that to kick in yeah I know a lot of people who are in completely different you know worlds do completely different things who all say having just someone there a coach a, a partner whatever it is like you said there sometimes just to hold you accountable or whether it's saying no you, you're right that's that's the right decision to do yeah. so do you feel like having that person that relationship with someone was was the key for you almost yeah a hundred percent you know because <clears throat> i work with my husband and i love my husband very much but it's a really difficult thing to to change from going out to work every day to suddenly sitting side by side yeah. he'd been running the 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 business which like I say it wasn't even a business it was this side thing that I was he was at first helping me out with and then he he stopped his work to focus on it purely as well suddenly you get a couple who are sitting side by side who've never actually worked properly together before and we're in a pandemic <laughs> and it's winter and we're basically locked in our home office together um, we needed to find ways that worked and I needed to have someone who was not involved with yeah. any of this that I could just run things yeah. through with that you know it meant I could I felt like I was coming to the table then a bit more prepared yeah. I didn't want him to have to carry me I didn't want him to get frustrated with me um, I like being good at what I do so I yeah. look at the, the what's the best thing I can do to make myself better at this right I'm gonna do that yeah and I've always done that right from I think when I was a teenager right from when I was very young I, I'd have a dream then that becomes a goal and then you work backwards and think, well, how do I make that happen? When I was in my early 20s, I moved to London with nothing and everything in the back seat of my car and slept on floors because yeah. I thought London is where I want to be to be a journalist. Yeah. So I did. Yeah. <laughs> and I worked for free and managed to eventually get a job. So, yeah. you know, you, you, you have a dream, you make a goal, then you figure out ways to make it happen and go to the best people and ask their advice. Yeah, that's amazing. One thing I think is really interesting is when you listen to you and, and the way you speak, you're so passionate about what you do and the world's moving so fast, everything's changing, it feels like almost like influence often like running the world. How did you find your space? Because clearly you, you are so passionate about that mm. and you want to you know, dominate that, that area and, and do the best you can for other people. How mm. did you find that? How did you get your passion? The world is a really noisy place and I, whilst it's a great thing that we have access to amazing amounts of information whether it's on you know, social media or online or, or books or however, podcasts, however you, you get your information, sometimes it's really hard to sort of distill down what you're listening to so that it speaks directly to you and I think that and what I mean by that is when you're bombarded with, with, with so much you kind of forget what you think about things and I think if you have a if you have your own passion try and be quite specific about it and seek out people who are experts in in their field because otherwise you can just be overwhelmed with so much information so for me um, how I try and make myself stand out in 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 that way when there is so much noise is I just stay true to what it is that I'm interested yeah. in rather than trying to be all things to all people which you know you're all you're doing is adding to that noise yeah. is I don't I'm careful about what I put out on social I I'm really quite focused on what I read and what I listen to and then that means that whatever I speak about and what I pass on stays really true yeah and also, it, it, it does make things a little bit easier. I think you, d you don't necessarily have to know everything about everything. But if you, if you stay focused on what your passion is, for me, it's on our behavior, how our mind works, how we work, how we can change our thought processes, and also just how that can help us feel really good about ourselves, whether yeah. it's um, your mental strength or your spirituality or, or what have you, um, rather than trying to be a chef. Yeah. or a fitness guru or a whatever <laughs> i don't know that but i'll happily speak to someone yeah. who does and pass that information on the way i stay true is i just make sure that what i talk about reflects who i am which is someone who is just i think a 
perfectly kind and nice person who wants to pay it forward. Yeah. Everything I learn, I just want to pay it forward. Yeah. And that's really interesting that you, um, that you talk about it in that way. Because I think there's so many people who would, would approach something that you're doing in a way of, right, okay, I can make a lot of money by doing this. Whereas mm. you've gone about it, as you said before, you know, you, you did your job, but you just had this thing that you were really passionate about and try and build and try to help people. Yeah. And then it's transferred almost into a business rather than the other way around of, you know, how can I take advantage of this? How can I make the most of this yeah. space? You've done it out of a passion and a caring for other people, which I think is definitely the best way around to do it. It's interesting because, you know, I know when I left when I left my job and I moved properly into this into this space, um, yeah, there were certain people who thought that that was what I was doing and didn't realize, actually, it has, it's taken me three years yeah. to get to this point. And I was, whilst everything I was offering up was free to everyone else, it wasn't free to run. Yeah. And so I have a team of freelancers that I was paying to make sure that everything offered was the best quality because I, I don't want to just put any old yeah. stuff out there and that costs money so I, I realized actually I needed to change my mindset to yeah. this and the way to do that was to make it a business and I, I mean I fought it which is a ridiculous way to start any business <laughs> is to fight the idea of making it a yeah. business um, but actually I realized that once you do that then one you're all in yeah. because you're not working every other job to, to keep this afloat, which is what I had been, had been doing. Yeah. You're so focused, it actually means you offer up so much more. And you, people are in, when they, when they come on board, they're really invested because yeah. then they've made, it's not just something they've come across, they've made a decision and they've yeah. decided to invest in themselves at whatever level. And I offer things at, at, at all sorts of different levels. Um, and I still put lots of, lots of um, free stuff out there because I think that's important as well. But the, what I realized was actually that means that mentally you've made a commitment yeah. and then it makes it a really beautiful experience because it means that I, I know that everything I'm, off, I'm offering up is going to people who are really up yeah. for listening to it yeah. and it becomes a really beautiful exchange. Yeah. And it was a steep learning curve for me actually. Um, but I'm, I'm really there now and I feel like I'm really in my groove yeah. and I'm really enjoying what I'm doing and I understand what I'm doing now, which I didn't before. Yeah. So you've got this platform, This Girl Is On Fire. You've obviously worked in television for a long time. You mentioned before you've finished your fourth book now. Yeah. So you've got loads of different outlets. Do you feel that's your best way to get out you and your, your vision, your passion? Is yeah. That the best way to get it out? I do because what I did before, working as a TV presenter is a brilliant job and I really genuinely loved it. It's a yeah. great job. Um, but a lot of the time you are you're hired because of your skill set and a bit of your bit of your personality because obviously everyone is, is unique. But you don't necessarily talk about things that you yourself are interested in. Yeah. Whereas for me now, it's so selfish, it's fantastic. <laughs> I'm literally just talking to people that I'm really interested in the subject matter yeah. and so that I can pay it forward. And it is, it's a, it's a wholly selfish exercise because I can take all the skills that I learned over sort of 25 years and now put it into something that is is really me. Yeah. I'm not saying I wasn't me before, yeah. but there was a big part of me that I didn't necessarily show because you get a lot more freedom now. Yes, I have so much more so much more freedom now. And also the when you're when you're working for a broadcaster, you're a, you're a, appealing to a much broader base of yeah. interest whereas now I'm appealing just to people who are interested in the things that I'm interested in. Yeah. So it makes it it's it's lots of fun. So you've talked a lot about, you know, you do a lot of work for women and you're, you're very passionate about women feeling good about themselves and being very confident within themselves. How's the perception of a woman that's worked in media different now to say you know, 25, 30 mm. years ago when you started working in this space? Really different. I think when I first started out, it was the, it was the 90s. Yeah. So um, there, was, there were very sort of, I suppose, very stereotypical ideas as to what a woman working in TV was, yeah. was like. As I joined was when it was just starting to change. So if women were allowed to be a lot freer, 
probably a bit naughtier, um, which was which was a, a lot of fun because I was in I was in my twenties and actually you you were allowed to sort of be a bit cheekier and and yeah. uh, uh, and be more, more yourself rather than just looking neat and tidy perfect. and perfect and yeah. reading autocue or doing whatever. Um, so that's great, but I think the biggest change that has happened is the the fact that the cutoff age for women working in TV seems to have gone yeah and hurrah because <laughs> the, the, it doesn't make any sense that you you get to a point where you build up all this knowledge and experience and everything yeah. else and then suddenly you're not useful anymore just yeah. because you don't look how you did when you're in your in your 20s everybody's useful everybody is has knowledge and experience and skill sets they're just different from when yeah. you're in your 50s as I am now to uh, in your in your 20s so for me that's actually really good yeah. and you are people are now hired to work in TV because of their passion rather than just sort of fitting into sort of cookie cutter ideas. So yeah. we, we have come a long way. There's still obviously a long way to go like there is with every part of our life. Yeah. But in terms of women in TV, actually, it's, it's moving in the right direction. So you've mentioned there's a couple of bits that, or there's still a way to go. Mm. What do you see as the next kind of logical or natural progression or, or next part that it can improve in? Um, I think that whilst Obviously, when you're when you're talking about the media, there's so many different facets to it. So, for for example, just talking about TV, yeah. it's a very specific thing, and it's very that's why it's great that you have uh, the internet and so people can can watch a different type of, of broadcasting. But in terms of TV, I think whilst we've come yeah. a really long way in what you see on TV represents real life, in terms of we come in all shapes, colours sizes creeds religions everything yeah um that wasn't necessarily reflected on the tv it was a v that was all you saw yeah. and we got so used to well that's just how it is yeah and i think it's really great now that actually it's becoming much more diverse. of a reflection yeah and i don't mean d d diverse in the in the sort of one yeah. sense that everyone thinks it is i just mean diverse yeah. in terms of we're not People. all just interested in five things yeah we're interested in lots of different things and we all look different and have different jobs and abilities and interests and all of that is starting to feed through now yeah. you know and that comes down to there's a lot more choice on tv when you know when i first joined there were four channels sure. yeah, <laughs> you're thousand, looking at me like <laughs> four channels <laughs> um and whereas now obviously there's there's hundreds and hundreds so yeah. no it's good that's amazing so we've mentioned already you know you've just finished your fourth book mm. a lot of people talk about when they write a book or when they write a book for the first time it's an amazing exercise to kind of learn more about themselves yeah do you feel that was the case with you? 100%. And, and I'm a big believer in journaling. Mm. I don't need to journal now. I just write books. <laughs> <laughs> it just all comes out. I just publish it. Um, yes. And the reason for that is, you know, one, I think journaling is really, really important. And I think that if you can offload and there's been a there's been studies that show that there's a direct link from your brain to your to your hands. So don't necessarily do it on a, on a keyboard. And you free flow, just write what you're feeling about whatever it is. And if you can do it every day, it yeah. can be a few lines or sometimes it'll be pages. For me, like I say, this is my fourth book. My first book was, was purely autobiographical. Yeah. So yes, that 100% was yeah. about me. Because <laughs> I've had a very interesting life. I, uh, I'm Scottish, but I grew up in the Caribbean. My, because of my dad's job, we traveled around the world a lot. I went to nine different schools by the time I was 17. Wow. Um, <laughs> I fell into TV, I didn't mean to. I wanted to be a journalist. And so there, there was a lot to, to pack in. And then every other book after that has been paying forward information that I've yeah. learned about. It's always started with an issue that I've had myself. I've researched, oh, okay, that's really fascinating. I'm gonna pay that forward. Yeah. So I've. My, my second book was about uh, the menopause. Yes. My third book was about burnout and breakdown. And my fourth book is about being brave and finding it within you to, to we all have courage, but it's kind of locked away. Yeah. And we're too scared to just sort of turn the key and let it out. And we're scared for so many reasons. We're scared of failing and we're also scared of doing really well yeah. because things will change for us. So my last book is about unlocking the courage actually we all have inside of us and yeah. you can either open the door and tiptoe out or you can open the door and go ta-da here I am doesn't yeah. matter we'll I, I show you basically oh. through the process of 10 ways in 10 days by the end of this 10 days you will I guarantee you will you will be 
braver. And it's, it's what's fascinating is it was through my own research on myself, listening to the people, and then I basically I put a challenge together and I tried and tested it on hundreds of women in my community. And I now just get choked. I feel like a proud mum. Really? I've literally seen women turn their life around oh, amazing. and do things that they never would have thought that they could do. And I don't mean bungee jumping and leaping out yeah, of planes. Yeah. I mean... Life. Life. Yeah. Just life. You know, women leaving relationships that didn't Hunger serve them. Women entering relationships they were too scared to have. Yeah. Women quitting jobs and starting new ones or going for promotion that they never thought that they were brave enough to do. So yeah. all my books come from uh, a place that I've been in myself. Yeah. Then I learn all about it and pass it yeah. on. Because it's like, that's what your friends do. You're just being a really yeah. good friend if you yeah. learn stuff and then pass <laughs> it on. I just pass it on to thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Yeah, that's amazing. So if we go back to your first book, your yeah. autobiography, what would you say the biggest thing you self-revelation, what did you learn the most about yourself if it was just like one thing? That's such a good question. What did I learn? I learned that um, I'm a lot more resilient than I thought I was. Okay. Because I didn't actually realize I'd been through so much. Yeah. Because when you're just living your experience, you're moment. just kind of getting on and getting through. And this is again why journaling is so important. But when you write it all down and then you look back, you realize, God, I've come so far. It's the equivalent of you get in the car and just drive and yeah. you never really look back at how many miles that you've done and how many obstacles you overcame. Yeah. It, that's why you know everyone really should do the version of writing their own autobiography because you realize how amazing you are. Yeah. And we do a version of that at home, which I would recommend everyone to do. And we have a big jar in our kitchen and a big pad of post-it notes and we the whole family does this and the reason we leave it out in the kitchen is so everyone can do it so it's like an annual autobiography and anytime something good happens and it can be anything absolutely anything write the date jot it down give me a, a line or two today i did da, 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 yeah. and put it in the jar and then on new year's eve or new year's day we oh. tip it all out into the kitchen and we look through and it reminds you of all the great things that happened that year because otherwise you'd forget yeah and it's such a joyous thing to do because we 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 have dreams we set goals we hit targets and then we just move on to the next one and we never take a moment to reflect it well that's really yeah. good you know yeah. well done me and whether it's kids or grown-ups it really doesn't matter and then i put it in an envelope stick it to the side and then we're just building up like a thing of envelopes yeah that's amazing i think especially that happens in the in this kind of time in the world because everything's so fast yeah you know you've gone from you know films to Facebook videos to Instagram videos to a TikTok which is 15 seconds. 100%. Everything's so fast you go oh yeah done next thing. You, like you said there you never stop whether you're you know working in television whether you're doing you know a, a nine to five job an athlete whatever it is. Yeah. I don't think you ever stop and go oh wow that was that was impressive. Yeah. Yeah that's an amazing exercise. I that was really I cool. was speaking to someone just a few days ago actually who was hugely hugely successful in his field and we'd, we'd just met that day. And over the course of the conversation, it became more and more apparent that yes, he was hugely successful and he's not famous, but he's, he's really well known in his field and very good. He was so unhappy. Mm. And so uh, this happens to me a lot at parties. I end up sitting in a corner and listening to, <laughs> to, to someone, yeah. which I enjoy and, yeah. and I don't mind at all. And one of the things I said to him was, when do you ever stop and acknowledge what you've you've done you know yes it's great you've done all these things but when do you ever give yourself a little pat on the back and he said oh I've got everything I need to get I don't need to reward myself you know I've got a nice watch and I you know yeah. my apartment's nice and all this I said it's not a, it's not about rewarding yourself with with things when do you just reward yourself for having achieved what yeah. is amazing stuff you know you don't sound very proud of yourself yeah. and so I'm I made him buy a journal I sat with him and he went on Amazon <laughs> and I was like right buy this thing I'm gonna send you a I'm gonna take a photograph of mine and, and and all of this and show you how to just get a bit more balance in your life and write down for example you know if I do this I'm gonna reward myself by I don't know like for me I know it sounds crazy, but I do literally, I sit in the jacuzzi yeah. <laughs> and I just sit for, I give myself 20 minutes, half an hour and just stop for a bit and watch the world go by, you yeah. know, watch, um, watch the planes in the sky and all this sort of thing. But 
go for a walk, mm -hmm. breathe, listen to something that isn't educational or don't take your phone with you. Have a moment and stop. You're yeah. rewarding yourself. Don't see it as just this other thing I've got to tick off my list. It's really interesting you say that because as you mentioned there, you know, really successful people, you know, I, I spend a lot of time with athletes and also you know, um, very successful people related to, to sport, whether it's psychologists or coaches, whatever yeah. it is. The most successful people are often the unhappiest, aren't they? Just because you never take that time to just yeah. stop and appreciate what's going on. But like you said there, often people who just kind of live in the moment, enjoy the day mm. and, and move forward with the life, often just enjoy life a yes. bit more. It's weird, isn't it? You're so right. The people who many of us look at and think they are there, hitting all their targets, they are uber successful. A lot of the time, they are very unhappy and I was that person and the reason I can I can speak about it now in terms of well, how are you rewarding yourself and this sort of thing is I've I've been through that whole thing I I I burned out I experienced a breakdown and one people are very ashamed about admitting this because it's a sign of they see it as a sign of weakness uh, and two people get to a point where they they know they're unhappy they know they're stressed but they don't know how to stop yeah. because whilst on one hand they're achieving all the things that society has told them is great, it's not feeling great. So then they're thinking, I must be doing it wrong. Yeah. Um, and actually that's th before your body lets you know and you end up getting physically ill and before your mind lets you know and you start experiencing anxiety and panic attacks and dark thoughts and depression and all of these things that are really signals that you are not in balance, You're, you know, yeah. things are not going as they should be. Um, recognize that it's starting to happen and sit down and really ask yourself some really honest questions and this goes back to what we're talking about coaching yeah that can really help you keep on an even keel and then ask yourself am i still enjoying what i'm doing okay if i'm enjoying parts of it how can i make it that i'm still doing those parts but how can i gradually remove the bits yeah. that that i'm not finding so great now there might be people listening to this who think I'm not a big superstar or an athlete or a Hollywood actor or whatever. How does this relate to me? But it, it still can, even if you, you're just doing a job just to pay the bills and you don't necessarily enjoy it and it's making you very stressed. Have a word with someone who you're working with, whether you've got an HR manager and, and explain how you feel and ask if there's maybe a sideways step that you can make so that your pay level stays the same so you're not suffering in that way. But maybe you're moving into a different area that you enjoy. Or if you can't do that, is there a hobby that you can form a group of people at work with that you can all do together? Yeah. It can it maybe mean once a week after work you all meet up and talk about this or it's a movie club or a book club or whatever club. And then suddenly you've got things that you're meeting and chatting about people at work with that isn't to do with work, that is something that you find really enjoyable. So technically nothing's changed. You're still doing a job you don't necessarily enjoy to bring the money in, but the experience of it has changed. That in itself can sometimes be enough just to keep you going. Yeah, I think that's what's, um, I think like you mentioned there, a lot of people would say, oh. You know, it's all right for you. Yeah, it's all right for you, it doesn't make sense. But I think, could you tell us a little, you meant you, you, know, you described it as a, a breakdown. Could mm. you go into a little bit more detail about that? Mm. Well, I, I ignored every single sign yeah. that my mind and body was telling me <laughs> that you need to stop, yeah. this isn't working for you, and um, it was like I was on a runaway horse. So what was it like for me? Mentally, my brain was whirring 100 miles an hour, just whirring, whirring, whirring. I had so much. I was saying yes to every single job that came in yeah. because I was, uh, I needed the, one, I needed the money to, to make my my side business work, which was This Girl's on Fire. Uh, but also, especially in, in sort of my business at the time, if people ask you to do things, you say yes, because you may never get the opportunity yeah. again. And so there's fear. So I realized I was actually operating 100% from a place of fear. Yeah. Fear of, of letting down the team that I had built and was paying to, to, to have this, this side hustle if you like is what it's called but also this fear that i may never get this these oppor opportunities again yeah and fear is a horrible motivator but it's actually what propels us 90 yeah. percent of the the time um it's so a fear of failure often as well isn't it you know, yeah if you, if you really push on and, and think oh well i don't want to fail so i'm going to keep pushing and pushing fear and pushing. of embarrassment yeah what if this doesn't work and everyone laughs at me 
well, I, I say <laughs> to that now sure. because actually the people who would laugh at you, they'd laugh at you anyway. Yeah. They will sneer at you even if it goes really well and you become a multi-billionaire. They'll think that, well, you know, you've yeah. clearly done something or, yeah. you know, it's all right for you. So don't even pay any attention to them. But you don't know that when you're in that mind space. Yeah. So, and then I started getting very low, very depressed, very anxious. Um, I, and I was taking anti-anxiety medication, beta blockers, which just to slow the heart rate down because yeah. my heart was just pounding all the time. And physically, um, I was pushing myself harder than I ever have. I was getting up at half five in the morning, hitting the gym. I was working out harder than I ever had done because I thought strong mind, strong body, I yeah. can do this. I was in the gym before my colleagues were awake. Yeah. Um, it was too much. Yeah. I tried to do too much. And in the end, um, a friend called me out and yeah. said, you're not right. And I started crying, couldn't stop, went home and made changes. So everything you talk about, you know, you're so passionate about people feeling good within themselves, being brave, as you mentioned about that latest book you've done, is all about your, your personal well-being. Mm. You mentioned there about, you know, you had a breakdown, as you called it. What kind of pillars do you think we're overlooking as, as people to be well, you know, not just physically, but especially mentally? What do you think we're overlooking? I think in terms of our, our mental strength, for example, it's, it's about creating better habits that are things that just become such a part of us that then they're, they're no longer a chore. It might feel a bit weird at first. So tiny, tiny little things like make your bed, the first thing you do in the morning when you get out of bed, make your bed. Then you've made it this beautiful thing that you're already, you've, one, you've ticked something off your list and you're, 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 you're proud of. And it's also a reward at the end of the day, you're getting yeah. into this amazing made bed. I never understand people who don't see it that way. It's yeah. not a chore, it's a reward to yourself. All, drink more water, it sounds like a crazy thing. What's that <laughs> got to do with anything? But if you're hydrated, then, every part of your body is, is working better. And actually you're less likely to just snack on rubbish, yeah. which instantly will make you feel really bad about yourself. <laughs> so just drink, just drink more water. Um, do some sort of movement every single day. You don't have to thrash yourself. You, people, and I, I, I had this mindset where if I didn't do an hour of really punishing workout, then I was failing in some sort of yeah. way. And I've had to readjust that within myself. So even if it is going for a, a few miles walk listening to a really interesting podcast or an audio book or even the birds it doesn't matter some sort of movement every day and get enough sleep yeah these are such boring core <laughs> pillars of what actually makes us work more efficiently as a as a human being none of those things have to be a chore yeah. they feel like a chore when netflix is really good and there's something on amazon prime that you really want to watch but keep the remote the remote next to you and just switch it off and yeah go to bed yeah. and it, it's it it will become a routine that you get into the habit of doing and once you get into the habit of getting a good night's sleep waking up ready and fresh to start your day then you start achieving more then you become kind of addicted to achieving yeah. really great things and then you want to do those things so it doesn't feel quite so strange yeah. and then it just becomes your habit and before you know it you have habits of excellence they've started out as chores and things yeah. to get used to and before you know it you you actually have habits of excellence and you feel great all around yeah I think one of the, the things that's most important as well picking up from what you said a little bit earlier is that you know people see you know someone who's got an amazing platform that's helping you know thousands and thousands of people but they don't see three years of draining money draining energy resources to to get that there you know they see an athlete winning a medal at Olympics they see someone having a business that's worth you know, millions of pounds, but they never see that and they think, oh, well, not, not nice for you, good yeah. for you. But Everything's an overnight success. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> I think, or, you know, whoever it is, you know, we, you know, I don't know things that go on behind you when you're trying yeah. to build up um, this girl's on fire or anything like that. And I think, you know, whoever it is thinks, oh, well, I've got problems, but that person who has done that hasn't got problems either. I think it's so important that it's normalized that everyone has Every, everyone is going to struggle in something, yeah. in some form, in some shape or size, and I think that's so important. I think this whole idea of, of being your best version of yourself and living your best life and all that sort of stuff, it is a double-edged sword. Yeah. Yes, it's amazing to live your best life and be your absolute truest best self, but be really careful that you're not doing it 
to somebody else's script. Yeah. Because so often people's idea of living a best life is leading an Instagram life that is to impress everyone else. Yeah. Living a best life doesn't have to be recorded. It's just how you feel about yourself. Yeah. And I think we've flipped that around somehow. 100%. So I think we, we just need to be really careful that the whole idea of living your best life is something that is 100% unique to you. It's not something that someone else has prescribed. Yeah. So you might think that someone else has got it easier than you and is more successful than you and living their best life, but that's theirs. Mm -hmm. Just do what you can with yours. Yeah. And remember, you don't have to post about it all the time. <laughs> yeah. You, um, you talk a lot about helping other people and everything we've spoken about today is so clear, your passion for helping other people. So as a mother, how do you feel you know, being a parent has shaped who you are today in, in that respect? Again, that's such a great question because until you're a parent, you don't get it yeah. <laughs> in that. You, you only think of parenting as when they're really little. Yeah. And you know, you get pregnant and have a baby and you raise the baby and try and teach it all the things that a parent teaches. Actually, you realize that when your children get older, you learn from them. And I hadn't fully appreciated this until my, my children are aged um, currently from around 20 to around 14. So Nick and I have four between us. And you learn so much, not just through watching them go through their own experiences and you, you realize you can't just say to them, well, I handled my experiences like this because their world is very different. Yeah. Um, but you also realize that you're just a grown up who is the same person you were when you were a teenager through 20s and 30s. And you're just learning as you go and you don't actually have all the answers. Yeah. For me, the, the biggest lesson that I've learned as a parent, you will mess up you will make mistakes but if you can put your hand on your heart and say I did the best that I could with the knowledge that I had with love in my heart and the best intentions as long as I've learned from that and I won't make that mistake again you're still being a good parent yeah. and I think so much of the time at, at least with me I was so fixated with getting everything right when they're babies and feeding them the organic yeah, yeah. and mushing everything up and sleep and all of that and da 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 actually accepting you're gonna get it wrong yeah doesn't make you a bad parent it makes you a normal human being it's it's not about the making mistakes it's what you do afterwards and that's what my children have taught yeah. me that's amazing so as your children are growing up and we've talked quite a lot about social media and, and the mm. pressure of of living now like you said there you know I've got to buy a 400 pound t-shirt and I've got to post it on Instagram because that's what people think is success or whatever do you feel what pressures do you see now in your children for example that they have to deal with that you perhaps didn't when you were younger Criticism. Okay. The biggest issue that, that young people have today is dealing with criticism. Yeah. And I, I really, really feel so sorry for younger people today. I'm older, so I can, it, it hurts, and I can block it, and I can cut it out and not listen, but there's still a core of it that it's, it's like death by paper cuts. It hurts. I would say if there's, the, the, the biggest pressure is being so afraid to put something out because someone's going to judge you. Yeah. Being afraid to make a mistake, someone's going to laugh at you. And being afraid to grow and learn through trial and error. And actually, there's this whole misconception that you have to succeed first time in everything you do, you have to nail it. And you don't, you learn by getting things wrong. If you look at all the best inventions in the world, they yeah. came about through trying something thousands Lots of times. Failures. And you can say each one was a failure, but scientists and inventors who I love because they're kind of bonkers in the best yeah. way, they see every failure as a step closer to finding something that works. And I, I worry that the, there's a younger generation who don't embrace failure and don't see that someone having a different opin opinion to them doesn't necessarily mean that they're against them. It just means you have a different opinion. Yeah. That's really interesting that you say that. I don't know if this is something you've thought about consciously, but you've said they're your biggest or worry for for a generation, for example, is criticism and they are scared to. Was that related to when you wrote your book about being brave? Around, you know, that's, that's what you're clearly yeah. very passionate about right now, but also you're worried about people not being able to be brave? It was a part of it. There's a, there's a section in it that is a, definitely about that um, because I was aiming the book at a, a whole age rage. And I do think that 
there are people of, of my age who are afraid to put things out because they think maybe I don't understand what's happening at the moment yeah. with various trains of thought. And there are young people who are frightened of putting things out into the public domain or even speaking amongst their, their peers now because people are very quick to trash and, and jump. And, and yeah, and judge. And so again, how I talk about it in the, in, in the book is a lot of this fear comes because we feel like we need to put everything out there. You don't. When you have a normal conversation with someone, you don't then broadcast it on the yeah. news. But really, that's what you do when you put every opinion that you have out. Why does the world need to know what you think about everything? Yeah. I, I don't understand why, <laughs> you know, or why does the world need to know what you feel about everything? It, it's great that there is a, there's this, this place of exchange, but it's become a place where it's not an exchange of ideas. And gosh, that's fascinating. I hadn't thought about it like that before. That's interesting. I don't think that way, but that's really fascinating that you do. Yeah. And then everyone cracks on with the rest of the yeah. day. It's, you think differently to me, therefore you must be against me. Mm that's not how the world runs everybody thinks differently about everything yeah the joy is finding a commonality and some sort of m place where we can meet in the middle um and that's what i worry about that isn't happening right now and i'm hoping that that will gradually change yeah definitely so so what's next for you then we've talked about you know this girl is on fire a lot is that mm. where all your energy and, and passion is going towards right now yes it is because i mean obviously i have i've lots of other little projects and, and passions. I'm still interested in fashion. I'm still interested in presenting and this sort of thing. But in, and, and I, I enjoy it. But what's great, that's now my side thing yeah. that, that I do. And everything that I choose now, it's flipped. That's all in line with where my true cause and my passion and everything else, whereas it used to be the yeah. other way around. And so everything that I say yes to is because I believe in it and I, or I enjoy it or it's just fun. Yeah. Or I think, I really like what they're doing. I'm going to get on board with them. Um, but it has to all come back to the core values of, of this Girls on Fire, which is, does what I'm doing, does it make people feel good about themselves? Is it educating them in some way? Is there something I can pass on? Or is it just fun? Yeah. Really, they're my core pillars right now. It's taken me a long time to get there.